just apologizing. <laughs> Um, this is just an amazing crowd. Thank you so much for coming. We actually had to go to the basement to get more chairs. And this room is so new that we didn't um, know how to open the glass walls in order to um, expand it. But I think we just fit, which is great. So I'd like to welcome you all to our third Talking in the Library event <laughs> for this, um, this semester. And we will have three more in the spring semester. So thank you so much for coming to hear Dr. Abibi talk this evening. Um, I'm Betsy Peck Learned. I'm the interim dean of the library. And um, the space that you're sitting in here is the Mary Teft White Cultural Center that has been transformed. And I'll, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Mrs. White, and then I'll tell you how this space is really um, being used differently now. Um, Mary Teft, or Happy White, was um, an alumna of the university. And she um, was a benefactress to this space that we're in now. Um, she really enjoyed our students here, and she enjoyed hearing their stories. And what she intended by endowing this space was to, um, to have people like Dr. Abibi come and speak to the students and encourage them and inspire them on their career paths. Um, so we're very grateful to Mrs. White. Um, she passed away, unfortunately, several years ago. But her son, John Hazen White Jr., who was here recently this fall to give our inaugural um, address, I guess, <laughs> um, talking in the library event here. Um, John Hazen White um, also gave us a very generous gift this year to transform this instant theater, is what we're calling it, this space, the Mary Tuff White Cultural Center Instant Theater, to a space that could be used um, when there are no events in here for students to coll work collaboratively and to study. So this is really state of the art technologically as well as um, a, a transformable space on campus. So we're very grateful to both of the whites for their um, generous donations. Um, and now I'd like to introduce Adam Braver, our writer in residence, and he will um, introduce Dr. Abibi. Thank you. Thanks, Betsy. I'll, I will be brief. Um, and the first thing I need to say before I, because I know I will forget this, is Professors McKenna and Dunn, or students of Professors McKenna and Dunn, I have your sign-up sheet. Um, I'm going to pass, start it passing around. Um, the, um, really welcome, uh, it's great to see all of you here, um, that, and I know this, uh, this particular event was also co-sponsored with the School of Justice Studies, and so I presume that many of the, you know, Faces that are not normally here are here as part of that, and, and welcome. We're glad you're here. Welcome, President Mrs. Farish, um, Provost um, Workman, somewhere in the back, moving chairs around earlier. Um, I think you'll be in for an interesting evening. Um, as a quick note, um, I, I, Semahina Baby, you know, can tell his story better than I can, so I won't uh, attempt to retell it. Only to only to let um, say briefly how we came to, to know Semahine is the students in the advocacy seminar course um, were working last year on the case of an Ethiopian um, political figure and writer named Abra Hadesta, um, who among many um, Ethiopian intellectuals was, was imprisoned um, and um, without really any charges uh, or, or trumped up charges. Um, as we tried to dig and get information, which was very difficult to, to get, um, we were put in touch with Semahine, who himself had been, um, uh, he'd been a, a professor of law in Ethiopia, he'd also been a prosecutor in Ethiopia, and, um, and had run into similar problems as some of these imprisoned people, but was maybe one step ahead in order to get out of the country before going to jail, um, and was connected with scholars at risk. And we, um, met several times with Semahine at the University of Connecticut where he's a uh, research fellow um, and an assistant professor. Yeah, visiting assistant professor. Um, and was just instrumental in not only helping, helping the students, helping me learn, but also just in educating us to, to a part of the world, to systems of the world, to legal systems of the world that were so out of our understanding. Um, and was very helpful in making it part of our understanding. So, um, so it seemed natural that we would want to have him share that with him. Um, 
when, when we meet with people from different parts of the region, um, there's often a few of us in the room and we always think, boy, we wish there were more people here to hear this because it's so fascinating and interesting. So, so now there are more people in the room. Um, and before I forget, in the back, there are two students at a table, Abby and Emily, with an assigned to sign a postcard for Professor Rafi. Uh, Professor Rafi is an Iranian chemist, retired chemist, who is currently in jail in Iran for um, um, some you know, critiques of the government um, in Iran. And they are organizing a, what is called a flood the mail drive, uh, a flood the jail with mail drive of sending postcards on a regular basis to him. So there are postcards back there available for signing. And um, on your way out, I, I hope you'll sign a, take, take, a, take a minute to sign a postcard. Um, but I will stop and um, very pleased to introduce Sema and a baby. Thank you very much. Um, uh, I am really very much pleased to be here today, and uh, I see uh, many of you coming to really uh, follow my speech. I am very much happy. Uh, I would like to also uh, really pass my uh, really appreciation to Adam because uh, they have really a very they are doing a very great job in terms of really promoting human rights. So uh, I am very much uh, really grateful for that. Uh, today, I am going to really, uh, through my story, I'm going to show you how it has become very difficult for uh, human rights activists and scholars in other parts of the world. And uh, this is not really, my story may not be really uh, very impressive compared to other people, but at least it would give really an insight into how uh, people pass through, uh, which uh, you may take granted here some of the freedoms and rights, but in other parts of the world, it is it's very different. So I will uh, share you the, the Ethiopian experience, uh, the democratization and human rights situation in that country, and uh, how uh, I myself really uh, uh, have been passing through that, that, that system. So first, I, I would give you a background about Ethiopia, the, the political system, its history, and also uh, the challenges we are facing. And then I will share you my, my story. Uh, Ethiopia is a country in the Horn of Africa. Uh, as you may know, the Horn of Africa is one of the, really the most uh, conflict-ridden part of the world. Uh, there is Somalia in the east. We have uh, Sudan and also South Sudan recently. Uh, Eritrea in the north, so it is really a region where there is a lot of conflict. Uh, when uh, uh, we see Ethiopia, it has really a long history. Uh, it has been uh, a country which has never been colonized uh, by uh, European colonial powers because Ethiopia had a long history of its own monarchy. Uh, which has been really, which were uh, protecting the country for uh, years. And also uh, the last uh, 40 years, uh, the most, the oldest fossil uh, is found in Ethiopia. So uh, it's like 3.2 million years of age. So it is considered, Ethiopia is now considered as the birthplace of uh, mankind. Uh, but it was characterized by, the, the history was characterized by civil war. Uh, conflict is, uh, for a long time. Uh, total population, I think many people will be surprised. Uh, recently, the CIA fact books uh, uh, stated that Ethiopia has almost 100 million people, uh, which is really uh, a big country. Uh, one of the really the fundamental uh, uh, feature uh, you know about Ethiopia, you, you may not need to know about Ethiopia, is it is very diverse. Uh, we have so many ethnic groups. We have so many linguistic groups, political groups. So that might have contributed for uh, really the conflicts because of lack of really uh, effective uh, system of governance in the country. Uh, the, there are, the, uh, in terms of religion, uh, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is the most dominant one. But also, uh, we have also a significant 
uh, proportion of the Muslim people and also Protestant people. So uh, it's, it's really uh, a diverse country. Uh, the recent history of the country, particularly uh, since in 1974, has been very difficult. Uh, after the end of uh, Emperor Haile Selassie, if you have heard about him, he is really uh, uh, long. Uh, uh, he, he ruled the country for a long time, uh, from in 1930 to 1974. And uh, he really uh, united the country and also uh, had really uh, a very repressive regime, uh, obviously, because it is a feudal uh, monarchy system. Uh, most of the political issues uh, raised by the student movement and also the military and others started during his time. Uh, because of really due to um, lack of also, I think, appropriate uh, policy, he was not willing to undertake political reforms to address the needs of the people during that time. So uh, he was really... Uh, resisting any change, and finally, I think this invited a very conflict uh, history in the country. In uh, 1974, uh, the military government came to power. He was removed from uh, uh, the power, and also uh, he was imprisoned, and later he was killed. Uh, the military government uh, immediately declared socialism to be the ideology, and uh, they engaged in killings, extrajudicial killings, arrests, torture. It, it was one of really the most uh, uh, serious, uh, challenging times in the country's history. Uh, as you see here, uh, uh, the Ethiopian dictator, the military dictator, Mengistu Ayla Mariam, is seen with uh, Fidel Castro because immediately after the revolution, Fidel Castro came to Ethiopia to visit and uh, this was really a new uh, era because before uh, the revolution, during the imperial time, Ethiopia was more uh, really related to the United States and other Western countries, but after the revolution, the history changed. Uh, so due to the repression, uh, different rebel groups came to uh, really operating, uh, particularly two uh, groups, one is called the Tigrayan People Liberation Front, which was later called the Ethiopian People's Revolutionary Democratic Front. And also the other one was the Ethiopian People's, uh, Eritrean People Liberation Front, which was fighting for the liberation of Eritrea. They were the ones who uh, really forcefully fight, uh, fought the military government for almost 17 years. So the country was under a very uh, devastating civil war for almost 17 years. Uh, finally, uh, uh, in 1991, the military government was removed by these rebel groups. And um, between in 1974 and 1991, almost maybe uh, one million people might have been killed by the conflict, civilian, military, and all. So it was very devastating. So the change of the regime in 1991 was very welcomed by many groups because it was uh, considered as a new era to really translate the country into democracy, protection of human rights, and really uh, where different political opinions will be uh, uh, strengthened in the country. Uh, that was a very uh, optimistic time. Uh, immediately, Different political organizations came together as a transitional justice system, as a transition from autocracy, conflict, to democracy. Uh, and a charter was uh, enacted, which was really uh, very uh, important because it recognized uh, the right to uh, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, uh, and also association, all the basic fundamental rights. But it was uh, uh, predominantly uh, dominated by the rebel groups which were which came to power so uh, during that time it was very interesting because for the first time most of us were able to read private newspapers private magazine and uh, really uh, we had enjoyed it for some time 
1995, we had also a constitution. After four years, the regime also enacted a constitution, which also really uh, recognized most of the international human rights treaties. Uh, so in terms of really providing the legal framework needed for transformation, I think uh, the, the first five years had done a lot. But um, the problem is practical. The practical implementation of the, the constitution or the human rights instruments. Uh, most of the constitutional provisions were not put into practice. They were not implemented. Uh, we had elections from in 1995 until recently in May 2015. All the elections were rigged. Uh, still now, uh, there is only one party ruling the country, the one the rebel groups which are now ruling the country. So uh, the, really the principles which are provided under the, the constitution and other legal documents were not put into practice. Uh, so the country uh, is according to the Freedom House annual report, the country is not free. So it is one of uh, a country where there is a repression. Uh, particularly, uh, which is also very much related to my story, is uh, the, the election we had in 2005. It was somehow uh, different from the others because the regime uh, decided that this time uh, let's give more space to opposition groups, uh, particularly freedom of uh, association and uh, uh, freedom of expression. Uh, so most of us, uh, or particularly scholars, journalists, human rights activists, were highly engaging during this election. But uh, after the election result was declared, because it was rigged, uh, there was really demonstration. At least 200 people were killed, and 30,000 people were imprisoned uh, during that time. It was really uh, one of really the most challenging times, even for, for myself. Uh, so I think the country's democratization process reversed after this time. This is really the most important time framework for the reversal of uh, democratic rights in the country. Uh, just last uh, May, the Ethiopian government uh, claimed that it won the election 100%. Uh, that means we have like 547 members of parliament and they have won all the members. So uh, I think it has become now absolute uh, dictatorship. Uh, the other is civil society groups uh, are highly restricted in the country. Before 2005, even though the regime was not really interested to promote human rights, there were many human rights groups operating in the country, but in 2009, the government came up, came up with a law that provided that uh, local uh, civil society groups may not be engaged in human rights activities, and also foreign human rights organizations were forbidden to conduct any human rights activities in the country. And also, uh, freedom of expression and also freedom of... Uh, uh, academic freedom were highly restricted after that time. They regulate even classroom. Uh, what you are saying in the classroom, what are you are doing outside the campus, and every uh, aspect of your life was under uh, surveillance uh, during that time. Uh, so there are now so many journalists and human rights activists in prison. Uh, uh, the, the, the picture uh, is fr uh, that of Skinder Nega. He is really a renowned journalist in the country. He has been uh, really in prison for many years, but final, the final imprisonment was in 2011 because uh, he was really uh, speaking really about freedom, about the rights of the people. Uh, in 2014, I think he won the award uh, from the Penn International, but still he is now in prison. He, was, he is sentenced for 18 years in prison uh, based on uh, a law, which is uh, uh, anti-terrorism law. The government is using 
anti-terrorism law to restrict freedom of expression in the country. So uh, whenever a person is uh, expressing his ideas, if it is against the government or if they don't like it, they would use the anti-terrorism law to arrest and also uh, imprison. The others are uh, very uh, 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 bloggers. They were blogging about freedom of expression in Ethiopia, constitutional rights in Ethiopia, uh, but they were in prison for one year. Uh, they were also uh, charged with uh, crimes of uh, terrorism. But finally, I think there was a, a very significant international pressure to release them, and I think they released just uh, last month from prison. There are still many of them. Uh, the one Adam expressed, uh, uh, indicated, there is a scholar, Abraha Desta, who is still now in prison. Uh, so, uh, it is a very difficult situation. Uh, the anti-terrorism law is the most important one used by the government. Uh, scholars, opposition party members, and activists are routinely arrested and tortured by the government. Still now, it is uh, continuing. Uh, what's interesting is... Ethiopia is considered as one of really the partners for the Western countries. Uh, last July, uh, even President uh, Obama visited uh, Ethiopia, and uh, annually Ethiopia receives uh, almost $4 billion uh, in the form of uh, development assistance. Uh, it's not clear why they are doing it, but there, there may be some... Uh, uh, really reasons they are doing it, because one is the fact that Ethiopia is considered as uh, fighting terrorism in the Horn of Africa, so they considered as a partner. The other is uh, there are some people who argue that Ethiopia is doing well in terms of expansion of education, health, and other uh, development infrastructure. But I think this has also very much undermined uh, our uh, advocacy activities, because when these democratic governments are working with such a repressive government, it has become very difficult for us, really, because it gave the regime a very uh, good legitimacy for the government. So uh, this is how the Ethiopian situation is look like. So when I come to my story, uh, I, I was I grew up uh, in the region where it is rural. Uh, most of uh, the people are farmers or related to. Uh, farming, uh, and also the time that was in 1980s, it was one of the most difficult times because, uh, as you may know, maybe the, in 1984-85, the worst famine happened in Ethiopia, and it claimed the lives of, I think, a million, a million people. That was the time when I was uh, uh, really a, a young person. And also the civil war was very serious during that time. So uh, I really passed through that conflict and all that uh, challenges. Uh, but despite all the challenges, I was able to join the university in 1992. This is uh, the, one of the, the biggest and also the best university in the country. It's Addis Ababa University. And uh, I decided to study law because I thought that this may help me to really contribute something for the country. So after five years of legal study, I started a job at uh, Ministry of Justice uh, as a pub public prosecutor. Uh, it was exciting for me because one, on the one hand, it was really an opportunity for me to bring uh, uh, those who commit crimes to, to justice, and I enjoyed it in that aspect, but there were many challenges to it because it was really highly uh, corrupted system the judges or the prosecutors or the police are corrupted and it is very difficult really to work uh, in uh, merit-based work. Uh, and also there are many cases. It's very difficult to address. And the, the, the most important part was most of the evidences produced against uh, people who are charged is based on confessions, forced confessions from the prisoners. 
it was usually presented in the, the court as uh, uh, evidence again. So it was very self-incriminating uh, statement uh, made by the prisoners were usually used. So that was not really, uh, I was not happy about it. So I decided to leave. And then I joined the university, uh, which is uh, as a lecturer. Uh, the university which I joined was different from the others because it is uh, a university which was established to train government officials and civil servants. So it was become very, very challenging because the students and also the administration are one way or the other part of the regime. Either they are members of the, the ruling party or they are supporters. So uh, that's how it began my problem. Whenever I speak about torture, whenever I speak about freedom of expression, there were always challenges uh, from the students. They try to intimidate. Uh, and also the university administration, they, you, they routinely uh, call me to their offices to tell me that they are not happy about the things that I was doing. So it was very challenging uh, to work there. Uh, I think that the, particularly after 2005, this was uh, a, an opposition uh, demonstration during the 2005 elections. I participated in this demonstration because I was actively involved during that time. Uh, after this time, it has changed uh, dramatically. Before 2005, they were really able to tolerate some, some aspect of dissent. But after the election, it has become clear that they are not willing to do it. Uh, as I told you earlier, almost uh, 200 people were killed during the demonstration. And it has become also threatening for myself. Uh, the opposition party leaders were imprisoned. Uh, most of my friends, colleagues were in prison. Uh, but I think I'm saved because uh, some people told me that I am under uh, really surveillance and I have to really take care, uh, particularly some of the students who are also part of the regime, but uh, who, are, uh, who are really uh, having good relationship with me, uh, who are police officers and also officials told me that I have to really stop what I was doing. So in 2006, I uh, seriously stopped what I was doing and I just uh, considered how to really escape because that was the only option. Uh, even some of the university officials told me clearly that either I have to really stop speaking against any of the things they are doing or I may face uh, some consequences. And also, I received some kind of warning notices. So I started to considering going out of the country. Uh, there were no many options, particularly to travel to other countries. You need visa and others. So the best option I thought was to really apply for some kind of uh, scholarships. And I, I know some a professor in Germany. Uh, I, uh, he knows me very well. And I really shared my story. Uh, he knows already the Ethiopian situation, and he even contacted the uh, Ethiopian embassy in uh, Addis Ababa to facilitate the visa, and I, he got me a scholarship, and I, in 2007, I went to Germany. It was a relief. Uh, on the one hand, I was really uh, relieved because, because I think I, I, I feel that I was safe uh, after that time, but also it was a time of challenge because it was a new life, I don't know the culture, I don't know the language. It really took me almost two, three years to really adapt to that life. But I don't have any choice, so I stayed in Germany for almost five years. I studied my uh, master's, LLM, and also my PhD. Uh, I was always expecting that there would be some kind of change in the country, so I'll be back. But uh, 2007, eight, so things were worsening particularly 2012. So I, I was really very much disappointed. So when I was finally completing my studies, I really uh, became uh, very uh, worried because what can I do now? So I was searching for some jobs or postdoc opportunities somewhere else. It was also not easy to find. 
But finally, when I was searching, I found uh, Scholars at Risk program, and I contacted them. I shared my story, and uh, my professor also really told them about my, my situation. Even other people wrote about myself, and I became really part of the Scholars at Risk system. So after that, uh, they helped me to find different, in, uh, different uh, workers in different universities to continue my work. The first uh, job I found was at the Irish Center for Human Rights at the National University of Ireland. I stayed for one year there. I was working on my book and also teaching a course on uh, international trade and human rights. Uh, so it was really a great experience there. Then I moved to the McGill Center for, uh, Center for Human Rights and Legal Pluralism. I was there also teaching a course on governance, governance and human rights in Africa. Uh, and also I was working on my book. Uh, my book, uh, this is uh, the book I published with the Ashgate Publisher. It is about the Ethiopian political system, the federal system, the democratic and human rights system. Uh, so after I finished my studies in, I mean my work in McGill, I moved to uh, Connecticut now, the last two years. I am now working in uh, the, the, the Institute of Human Rights at uh, the University of Connecticut. I have continued my uh, research and teaching. I am teaching on African human rights and democracy. And also, I am doing research on different issues, on legal pluralism in Africa, about uh, rights-based approach to development, uh, and also I am involved in different research groups uh, in the university. The other thing which I am doing is on uh, advocacy. I work with different human rights organizations. Uh, I write also blogs about human rights in Ethiopia. So um, uh, I'm trying to really continue my work and also to contribute to the, the really to change the political repression in Ethiopia. But still, as I told you, uh, due to the, really the international situation, the case of terrorism and all other things have really undermined our efforts. And I always hope that things would uh, really uh, improve or there should be some kind of reform and so that I may go back to uh, my country and contribute to uh, really the people because uh, Ethiopia is one of really the poorest country. We need people to teach in the university as well as in different ways, but still we couldn't go back uh, and really things are continuing like this. So, that's how, that's my story, and that's the situation in Ethiopia, and really I'm happy that uh, I have the opportunity to share my story. Uh, if you have questions or any uh, comments, I'm very much happy. Thank you for listening. First of all, I wanted to say thank you for coming and sharing your story. Um, so my question is, do you think that someday you will be able to go back to Ethiopia? Yeah, <clears throat> uh, this is a good question. Uh, I think it's, it's very, some, uh, sometimes I feel that really there will be some reforms. But uh, for instance, uh, uh, if you remember during the 2011 uh, 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 Arab Spring, Really, we have hoped that I think this would change. This, would, this change would also affect uh, Africa and also Ethiopia, and there would be some kind of change in the country. But I think, uh, as you know, uh, the revolutions that were held in Egypt or in Libya and other countries they have become now very problematic. And uh, really, when I see all this kind of international developments. Uh, I feel that it may be it may take some time, 
particularly uh, when you see the really the issue of terrorism. It has become the focus of many international uh, leaders. Uh, so uh, there is no now really much focus on uh, promotion of human rights. And also, one of the really the very interesting thing which is happening in Africa is the involvement of China in the last uh, uh, two decades. Uh, most African countries now resorted to uh, get resources from uh, China and more and more limited influence from Western countries. So they are follow like for instance, the Ethiopian government is following the Chinese model, which is uh, human rights repression, but on the other hand, they try to uh, bring about economic development, which uh, without uh, any kind of uh, uh, any kind of human rights perspective. So. Uh, it is really uh, very challenging for changes to come, but uh, I hope that at least either uh, there may be international uh, dynamics uh, which would uh, force the government to make some changes. And also, we have so many uh, challenges. For instance, we have uh, minority rights to be addressed. There are many groups demanding for rights. And we have also uh, now uh, there are like 8.2 million people are now in food assistance, in need of food assistance. These are all challenges which need some kind of political reforms, democratic reforms. So uh, it is, it's really uh, uh, sometimes I feel that I, I will go someday, but sometimes I feel that it's hopeless. So uh, it is really uh, a difficult situation. Thank you. Um, hello. Oh. Um, you said that the United States was like a big supporter and helped like give them a lot of money. Do you wish that they were doing more to help like reform the government, <coughs> or do you think that it would be better for it to kind of happen on its own? Because when the United States gets involved, sometimes things can go wrong. Yeah, uh, it's a very good question. Uh, uh, you know, uh, for the, the United States, from their position, uh, the most important thing they consider is stability of the region. If you know about Al-Shabaab in Somalia, they're, they're a fundamental uh, uh, terrorist group operating in, in Somalia. Uh, the Ethiopian security forces are fighting uh, the, this uh, terrorist group in Somalia. So for the United States, the most important um, interest in the region is security of the, the, the country. But th there is a challenge here. For instance, if you recall... Uh, they were working with Egypt. They were working with Libya. So how could uh, a stability of uh, a repressive regime can stay long? So I think the most important uh, really process for the, the United States interest is working with uh, promoting democracy and human rights. Because when there is democracy and human rights, there will be stability. So I think it's a kind of short-term kind of approach of the United States. They wanted, for the present time, they wanted uh, really some kind of stability. But when this repression continues, and one day when there is a revolution, like Libya, you can't even manage it. So I think they are ignoring the, the, really the accumulated grievances of the people. Uh, what is interesting is when you when you read the, the United States annual State Department human rights report, they document every human rights violation in the country, but still they are supporting it. So whether they have to stop it or not, I think what what should be done is there should be some kind of condition, at least. When President Obama was visiting the country. At least, you know, she should have really demanded for release of political prisoners. At least some kind of conditions to be made before they accept 
some of the, the assistance they get. So uh, I, last, I think, before a week, I was at uh, uh, New York University uh, at the law school. I was uh, presenting my uh, uh, paper. The same question was raised. Uh, what if the United States and other governments continue to uh, support these countries? I think uh, if they don't really uh, enforce the conditions, they have to stop uh, uh, providing uh, development assistance to these countries. They can provide assistance like humanitarian assistance for these countries. If these countries are not willing to undertake any democratic reform, I think there should not be any kind of development assistance because there is corruption, uh, really it's not clear who's benefited from this assistance. And also this assistance is highly used to entrench a repressive government. So uh, I think there should be a condition and if they couldn't uh, really enforce the government, I think if they uh, stop it for some time, the government would come because they can't, they can't uh, exist without development assistance. Almost 45% of the annual budget of the country is from foreign assistance. So I think the problem with the United States and others is they are not forcefully really uh, uh, demanding conditions from the government. So uh, that's the situation now we, have, we are in. Um, you said that there was people getting killed in Ethiopia. Do you think that there will ever be a decrease in people and children getting killed in, e in Ethiopia? Thank you. Uh, when it is uh, compared to the, the time of the military government, uh, during that time there was civil war and most of the victims were children and women. Uh, that was really very, during that time, almost a million people died. The, the famine, uh, many of the children and women died. When you see now the, the, the situation, um, the government is uh, targeting those uh, people who are trying to uh, demand for their rights, particularly uh, university students, scholars, journalists, human rights activists. So uh, really the, the number of women and children dying from the conflict has, has really significantly uh, uh, decreased, but uh, uh, particularly for young people, uh, women, and, women also and also men, and also scholars and university students has become uh, very problematic. So uh, still continuing, but it's not really uh, directly killing children and women is not really the same as it was before. But uh, there are other cases uh, which, which, is, which, are, which are affecting women and children. Uh, the, the one is uh, the famine. We have a very serious famine now, like 8.2 million people are affected. So uh, women and children are the most affected ones. And also, uh, Due to the ethnic-based political system we are following, there are some conflicts, uh, particularly one tribal group or ethnic group fighting with the other, and there are displacements of women and children from their places. So still, I think they are, they are continued to be affected. And also, uh, uh, until I think there is some kind of appropriate political reform and also addressing economic demands of these people, I think that it, it, would have, it, it would continue affecting women and children uh, that way. Tim, I have a question for you. Um, the anti-terrorism laws you've cited as being really a turning point, in, yes. and, 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 and terrorism being a broad term, meaning a, a journalist who, who critiques the you know, critiques the government is, is considered a terrorist, an academic such as yourself who 
talks critically about a, a government policy is considered a terrorist, correct? Yes, they are. Um, foreign journalists, right, are, they, they've, they've uh, the Ethiopian government has imprisoned foreign journalists in the country as well, searching for stories. So my question is, and, and also the one to five policy, is that what it is? Yeah, one um, to five system, yeah. Which is? Surveillance system. Right, so yeah. there's essentially four people watching everyone. One, yeah, one people, one, one person, person watching four people, yeah. So my question is within the system, if you're there, what can, what, you know, how does someone get legal representation? What are people doing with, within the system if being, if expressing oneself is, is, yeah. is, is to the legal law, to, you know, to the letter of the law being a terrorist, what are people doing inside? How do lawyers work in there, for example? How do they defend someone like that? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a very uh, good question. Uh, I have still friends and uh, my colleagues who are lawyers, who are uh, teaching in the university, in they are involved in many ways. Uh, the system works uh, uh, in a kind of uh, fear. Uh, they used the anti-terrorism law. Clearly, the terrorism law is uh, applicable to uh, terrorists or people who are trying to destabilize the, the, the country or the system. But they interpret, the, the, the very broadly interpreting, if you are, if they say that if you are critical of the government and writing something, they, they say that it is against the stability of the country. So it is an act of terrorism. So uh, even those people who are charged with uh, uh, crimes of terrorism, it is very difficult for them to find legal representation. There are only some very, really uh, brave lawyers who decide to be representative, to represent these uh, uh, people. Uh, most of the people, they don't want to engage in these cases. Most of the lawyers, they would uh, work in other cases, civil cases or uh, ordinary criminal cases. But whenever there is some cases which involve uh, the government or politics, they avoid it. Even uh, if you really approach any lawyer or any scholar in Ethiopia and ask him about human rights or the democratization, they, they don't even speak because they know the consequences. So uh, as Adam raised, they have now established a kind of uh, one to five system. That is, uh, in the university, the students, for instance, one university student should regulate five people, and these five people would uh, meet regularly uh, per week or two weeks' time. They have to report what have they witnessed or any kind of unusual activities in the campus or anything, or any person who said something against the government, even the university professors. They are ordered, organized under the system. The civil servants, they are organized under system. The, the, the farmers, they are organized under system. What the, the, the government claims that they use this system to really promote development, to get really people organized so that they would meet economic and social demands. But it is not. It is a surveillance system, a control system. They use this. So uh, uh, really, people are really under a very severe fear. So as much as possible, they try to avoid any kind of contact with the government. Even my family, members of my family, they always tell me that I have to stop doing this because it is threatening. Not only for me here, but uh, here I, am, I may be safe place, but it may affect my family back home sometimes. If I really continue and challenge the government, they try to use your family back home so that they will t tell you that you have to stop it. So it is really a complete uh, repression happening in the country. Yeah. If there was somebody there. Uh, you kind of already answered my question, uh, but it was 
uh, after your exile, were you uh, able to maintain contact with your friends and family back home, or uh, have they been too afraid of the consequences to kind of speak to you or, or, or be friends? And yeah. Stuff? Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I continued my contact. Particularly what's very, uh, I'm very much happy is uh, our, t our time, you know, the 21st century is a, a technology development. Uh, the internet and uh, Viber, Skype, email, and all these communications have helped really us to communicate because, uh, for instance, in 2013, the government was decided uh, deciding to stop uh, Skype system. But even if they try to do it, there are many ways to communicate. Uh, when you see the, inter the internet uh, uh, penetration in the country, it's only 2%. But still, we have uh, friends, colleagues, families that have internet access uh, and also teleco telephone access. So we, we continue communicating. That's why I do my research too. That's how I, I collect data and interview people and try to include it in my research. So I continue really communicating. Uh, we have many uh, uh, websites, uh, Ethiopian websites working from uh, different countries, in the US and Europe. Uh, the Ethiopian government has blocked all of them. You can't access all these websites from Ethiopia. But we get information and that we publish uh, the information for the people in Ethiopia. There are some ways that um, uh, Ethiopian, uh, especially some active people, can access these uh, sites using different ways by uh, really breaking the, the blockage. So uh, we have really strong connections. Yeah. Thank you. So we have one more question here. <laughs> and also, yeah, I think. I was just going to ask um, <clears throat> do you think that since Ethiopia wasn't colonized, did that take a big part of? Uh, of the government and how corrupt it is? Because I would kind of think that, you know, the fact that it wasn't um, colonized, it would, it would be kind of further as far as an African country to develop more. Do you think that kind of played a role in that? Yeah, uh, very interesting. Um, it is really usually when I, uh, when I am really uh, thinking about this thing, what, what is really the significance of uh, maintaining uh, independence uh, most of the African countries, almost all of them, passed through colonial rule, and Ethiopia was not. Clearly, there are differences, uh, particularly uh, in terms of really accepting or being open to new way of life or new uh, kind of thinking. It has become very difficult in Ethiopia because uh, it was blocked for many years from international communication. Uh, so one thing which, which I see which is very different from other countries is when you, for instance, I, I, I always try to compare uh, uh, the 2007 crisis in Kenya. The same time in 2005, we have the same political crisis. The way uh, Ethiopia and Kenya try to address is very different. For Kenya, the political groups, they uh, negotiated and they established power sharing. And they continued working on uh, with ha coming up with a new constitution. So now I think the country is going well in terms of uh, uh, really addressing human rights and also conflict. When you come to Ethiopia, the, the culture of repression that continued for really hundreds of years. It has been, it has never been really addressed. Still the political elites, they don't have any willing to negotiate or to try to share power. It is a kind of, uh, if you win, you take all. There is no any negotiation. Uh, if you are in power, the people and all other groups have the obligation to accept. So I think it, it really, uh, the, the Ethiopian independence has seriously, uh, we're proud of it because we have, seri we have maintained our culture compared to other African countries. Uh, Ethiopia is using its own language nationally. We don't use English 
we don't use French as a national language. We use our own language, some Harik and others. That's really a great thing. But in terms of really uh, being open to this uh, new modern political thinking, opposition party, uh, and also uh, journalism or freedom of expression, I think that has really, uh, it is really holding us back uh, from uh, being changed. That's how I see it. Well, thank you, Sema Hyman, and thank you for being here, and um, you'll be around a little bit if people have questions. Um, and thanks for all of you coming out. Again, there are some postcards back here with Emily alone at the table. There's some cheese as well back here. Um, and we'll see you, the rest of you next semester. Thank you. Thank you.